All right, guys. So welcome to our program today. We're going to be talking about decision making. All of us have a responsibility in this time of crisis. We have to make better decisions. It's easier said than done because most of us were doing it for fun, right? Yeah. No. So the decision that you make can be helpful as to how we get through this crisis. Adults, you have a responsibility to obey the, the curfew orders, to obey social distancing, to wash your hands, a responsibility to be disciplined, to do your homeworks, to make sure you're getting the information online. And so decision making is critical. As we have seen in social media and on the television so far, and I have told you before, every decision has consequences. And so persons are being locked up, they're being charged, and they're going to be finding themselves in a huge financial burden. Why? Because we're making bad decisions. And so I won't stay here and behave like I'm perfect. I've made some bad decisions in the past. So let me confess first before I give you my tips for today. I remember I was on the praise team at church, and there was a particular sister who I did not to, uh, we didn't get along very well. And so they were singing this song, um, Jesus Bigger Than What People Say, and then we got to the part when she came around and pastor said we should greet each other. She looked directly in my eyes, and she said, oh, you big so, oh, you big so. And so the spirit moved, and my hand accidentally caught her in her face. And so persons thought that I did that deliberately. I'm not sure, but I prayed and asked God to forgive me. So that wasn't such a good decision because guess what? The consequences was I was asked to step aside from the praise team and not to be a part of that anymore. And so, but I'm encouraging you guys that in making decisions, you think about the consequences. All right, guys, so on a more serious note, in terms of the tips, so let's look at them. One, we're asked to practice social distancing. I know you may live in a community where the camaraderie and the, the community spirit is, it embraces closeness, but let us say, if you go ahead and you don't practice social distancing and you get the virus, persons in the community are going to scorn you. They're probably even going to blame you, that you are the one who are disobedient and brought it to them then you will not be smiling. Secondly, we're asked to get off the road by a certain time. Can't emphasize it or overemphasize it. If you break the law, you're going to be paying millions of dollars or spend a year in prison. That is a consequence of you disobeying the order set by the police. Please, let us obey the order of the land and the government and get off the road because you may be harming somebody else if you have the virus. Uh, you may have a neighbor that you long to see and you go to look for her, she's elderly. Not to say that only elderly persons have the disease, uh, but you can infect another person. So please let us practice those things. The third thing I want to encourage you to do in terms of a tip is that we need to stop stigmatizing persons, okay? Uh, we have heard of stories where persons were thrown off the bus because they cough. Now let's just say somebody even did cough on the bus and you physically go close to them to choke them, to punch them. You're putting yourself in harm's way. The best thing to do is to try and inform that person. Say, hey, sir, ma'am, if you're coughing, cough in your sleeve or cough in a handkerchief or something like that. Let us practice the things that we're asked to do this COVID-19 is no joke. And for a disclaimer, the situation about the church is though, we are best of friends. God bless you. yourself and your family from coronavirus or COVID-19. A face mask is one method used to prevent the spread of disease. They do so by reducing the spread of germs. When you cough, sneeze, or talk, 
you release tiny droplets in the air that may infect others. Please remember, disposable masks must be used once and thrown into a garbage can. To put your mask on, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water. Check if there are any visible tears or holes on the mask. If there are none, hold the mask by the air loops. Place a loop around each ear, then pinch or bend the stiff edge to the shape of your nose. Pull the bottom of the mask over your chin. If you have a face mask with a band, hold the mask in your hand by the nose piece with your fingertips. You will see the headband hanging freely. Bring the mask to your nose level, then pull the top strap over your head. When it is time to remove the face mask, wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. You can also use a hand sanitizer to clean your hands. Whatever you do, make sure you don't touch the front of the mask. Remember, the front of the mask is contaminated. If you have the face mask with a band, lift the band over your head to remove the mask. If you have a face mask with ear loops, only touch the ear loops. Hold both of the ear loops and gently lift and remove the mask from your face. Throw the mask in the garbage, then wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. Protect yourself and your family from COVID-19. <laughs> the point of wearing a mask is to prevent the spread of air droplets from persons who may or may not be infected. When wearing a mask, please ensure that the mask goes above the nose and below the chin. This might be a bit uncomfortable, but it's for your own safety. The position of the mask is very important. It should not be worn on your forehead, under your chin, or on your neck. Please do not remove the mask when speaking. This actually causes more droplets to be released into the atmosphere. Trust me, if you have on a mask, we will still hear you. When you're removing a mask, try not to touch the front of the mask. If you do, Remember to wash your hands or use hand sanitizer. Please throw away the mask appropriately. Remember, partial protection is better than no protection. An important message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. How to wash your hands. Firstly, wet your hands. Then apply some soap. Rub your hands palm to palm. Lather the backs of your hands. Scrub between your fingers. Rub the backs of fingers on the opposing palms. Then clean your thumbs. Make sure to wash your fingernails and fingertips. Rinse your hands. Then dry with a single-use towel. Use this towel to turn off the faucet. And now your hands are clean. When to wash your hands after coughing or sneezing, after taking public transportation, when caring for the sick, before, during, and after you prepare and eat food, after toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty, after handling animals or animal waste. An important message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. My people, my people, my people, many of us feel concerned or overwhelmed by what is happening with the novel coronavirus around the world and here in Jamaica. It is no different for our beautiful children, parents and caregivers. I beg you to take the time to talk with your children about how they are feeling and how they can protect themselves. Guess what? We have some tips for you. Help your children not to panic. You know, sometimes when children hear the word Corona or COVID-19, they panic, they get worried, and that's okay. But it's up to us to help settle their nerves. First thing we need to do is be calm as parents and adults. Stop, breathe in, breathe out. And now is the time to start the conversation with your children to find out what they've heard or what they know. And then use age appropriate language that your children will understand so that they can explore their fears and to comfort them. Also remind your children that most people who get COVID-19 do not get very sick and they do recover. Encourage your children to get the facts. There's a lot of fake news and wrong information out there. So please encourage your children to get the facts. Now, 
your older children especially who are exposed to social media they could be exposed to a lot of wrong information so you know what if your child asks you a question and you do not know the answer now is not the time to guess what you're going to do is you're going to check reliable sources you're going to check the world health organization you're going to check paho the pan-american health organization you're going to check the ministry of health and wellness and of course you're going to check unicef they are good sources of information check them you and your child can learn no it's not about the doom and gloom alone you know I want you to share the good stories too. The stories of triumph, the stories of our health sector workers who are on the front lines ensuring that we bring this pandemic under control. Listen, in every obstacle you have opportunity. This is a good time for some family time getting closer. All right? Make sure your children know how to protect themselves. So talk to them about six simple steps. Number one, wash their hands. And I don't just mean talk to them, but show them how to do it the right way. They are to wash their hands frequently with soap and water for about 20 seconds. Or if you're like my eight-year-old daughter, she'll tell you the length of time it takes you to sing the ABCs. Whatever you do though, make it fun, especially if you have younger children. Make up a dance, make up a song, just have them washing their hands as much as possible. Number two, they are to cover those mouths and noses if they are coughing or sneezing. And they should do it with a bent elbow, or as I like to call it, the dab, or they can go ahead and use a tissue, just that as long as they throw away that tissue in the bin, remind them they're not to leave it on any surfaces or areas. Number three, and this is an important one, avoid close contact with persons who might have the cold or flu-like symptoms, but also remind your children not to be unkind to those persons who might be sick. We want to show them love and respect in all of this. Number four, and I know this is a hard one, but remind your children to avoid touching their face as much as possible. Number five, use or create new ways of greetings. You heard me. No hugs, no handshakes, no high fives. How about those air hugs, those namastes, the foot knocking, the wagwan? Whatever you do, keep your distance. Number six, advise your children to tell you or another adult right away if they are feeling sick or displaying symptoms, such as coughing, shortness of breath, or fever. Just let them know that this is extremely important so that you can get them the medical help they really need. Now listen, the coronavirus thing, it's a new issue for both adults as well as the children. So while you're teaching them, be patient. Make sure that it is conversational. Make sure you're holding a reasoning. This is not a beat and teach kind of situation, all right? And the most important, you have to be doing it as well. So just stay safe. Not all heroes wear capes. Some wear scrubs, masks, gloves, boots, and some may even carry a stethoscope. Let's acknowledge our local heroes, our nurses, doctors, paramedics, technicians, soldiers, and our police officers. What makes them unsung heroes? They are selfless. They risk their lives for others daily and commit to putting others before themselves. There are many other persons who are also essential in these unprecedented times to include you. Yes, you. Thank you for playing your part as we fight this pandemic. Your efforts to stay home and to abide by the measures implemented do not go unnoticed. Please continue to help us keep you safe. Hello? Hello? You? Hello? Yeah, you. Well, on, and a pandemic winner. You're now wearing a mask, you're now washing a hand, and you're now keep the required six feet distancing from other people. And what could I really cause you? You need to stop it. That no mask, no wash, and no distance something there, nah, keep. You know what keep? COVID-19. Yeah, it no gone nowhere. COVID-19, they are same way. So here why you are going to do for all of it. Wear your mask. Wash or sanitize your hands pan a regular. And yeah, keep your distance, please. And thanks. <laughs> the good news is, 
you can protect yourself and your family against the coronavirus called COVID-19. We touch lots of things every day, like doorknobs, phones, keyboards, tables, cupboard drawers, refrigerator drawers, and light switches. Don't touch these things unless you absolutely have to. One way to lower the risk of getting the virus is to wipe down everything at the start of the day. Clean frequently touched surfaces and objects at home, like doorknobs with disinfectant or soap and water. Once done, wash your hands properly. Protect yourself and your parents from the coronavirus or COVID-19. The king may rule over land and sea. The lord may live right royally. The soldier ride in pomp and pride. The sailor roam over ocean wide. But this or that, whatever befall, the farmer, he must feed them all. The writer thinks, the poet sings. The craftsman fashion wondrous things. The doctor heals, the lawyer pleads, the miner follows the precious leads. But this or that, whatever befall, the farmer, he must feed them all. The merchant, he may buy and sell, the teacher do his duty well. But men may toil through busy days, or men may stroll through pleasant ways. From king to beggar, whatever befall, the farmer, he must feed them all. The farmer's trade is one of worth. He's partner with the sky and earth. He's partner with the sun and rain, and no man loses for his gain. And men may rise, or men may fall, but the farmer, he must feed them all. God bless the man who sows the meat, who finds us milk and fruit and meat. May his purse be heavy, his heart be light, his cattle and pigs and all go right. God bless the seeds his hands let fall, for the farmer who must feed us all. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you think you've been exposed to COVID-19, stay home, self-isolate immediately, and call 888-1-LOVE. That's 888-663-5683. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. COVID-19 is still here. Always wear your mask correctly while in public places, covering your nose and mouth at all times. Masks should never be worn over the head, under your chin, below your nose, or hanging from your ears. Recovery from COVID-19 can take up to 60 days or more. The mask or the ventilator, you choose. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. The next person in line, your friend at school or your co-worker may have COVID-19 and not know because they have no symptoms. You on the other hand could be hospitalized for two months or more if you become infected. Is it worth it? Stay socially connected but keep the physical distance. Stay six feet away and avoid a hospital stay. COVID-19 is not over. Protect yourself while protecting others. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. An important message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. How to wash your hands. Firstly, wet your hands. Then, apply some soap. Rub your hands palm to palm. Lather the backs of your hands. Scrub between your fingers. 
Rub the backs of fingers on the opposing palms. Then clean your thumbs. Make sure to wash your fingernails and fingertips. Rinse your hands. Then dry with a single-use towel. Use this towel to turn off the faucet. And now your hands are clean. When to wash your hands? After coughing or sneezing? After taking public transportation? When caring for the sick? Before, during, and after you prepare and eat food? After toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty, after handling animals or animal waste. An important message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Coronavirus is in Jamaica, and I know you feel scared and worried. But you can't let COVID-19 divide us. Coronavirus infects all kinds of people. It doesn't discriminate. So why should you? When someone coughs or sneezes or shows signs of the virus, tell them to call 888 one love immediately and remember stay six feet away but don't attack or disrespect them because we're all in this thing together come on jamaica cut the hate and don't discriminate let us stand together and fight covid19 as one family one nation The point of wearing a mask is to prevent the spread of air droplets from persons who may or may not be infected. When wearing a mask, please ensure that the mask goes above the nose and below the chin. This might be a bit uncomfortable, but it's for your own safety. The position of the mask is very important. It should not be worn on your forehead, under your chin, or on your neck. Please do not remove the mask when speaking. This actually causes more droplets to be released into the atmosphere. Trust me, if you have on a mask, we will still hear you. When you're removing a mask, try not to touch the front of the mask. If you do, remember to wash your hands or use hand sanitizer. Please throw away the mask appropriately. Remember, partial protection is better than no protection. Not all heroes wear capes. Some wear scrubs, masks, gloves, boots, and some may even carry a stethoscope. Let's acknowledge our local heroes, our nurses, doctors, paramedics, technicians, soldiers, and our police officers. What makes them unsung heroes? They are selfless. They risk their lives for others daily and commit to putting others before themselves. There are many other persons who are also essential in these unprecedented times to include you. Yes, you! Thank you for playing your part as we fight this pandemic. Your efforts to stay home and to abide by the measures implemented do not go unnoticed. Please, continue to help us keep you safe. and your family against the coronavirus called COVID-19. We often touch our face to calm ourselves down. This can be dangerous as the virus gets into your body when we touch our eyes, nose, or mouth. One way to break the habit of touching your face is to cross your hands. Please try not to touch your face if you have not washed your hands with soap and water or before using a hand sanitizer. Protect yourself and your parents from the coronavirus or COVID-19. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you think you've been exposed to COVID-19, stay home, self-isolate immediately, and call 888-1-LOVE. That's 888-663-5683. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness.
A message from the Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness. Under the Disaster Risk Management Act, you must wear a mask in all public access places and in public transportation. If you wear a mask and I wear a mask, we are all safer. That was a message from Most Honorable Andrew Holness. Healthcare workers are working very hard to ensure lives are saved and people recover quickly from COVID-19. But their work is becoming harder because you're not wearing your mask, washing your hands with soap and water, or using hand sanitizer, and you are not maintaining physical distance. Let's limit the need for hospital beds and ventilators. Do the right thing. Cover your nose and mouth with a mask. Practice good hand hygiene and maintain a physical distance of six feet between you and others. COVID-19 is not over. Protect yourself while protecting others. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and good evening to all who are in the room here at the S Hotel in Montego Bay, where we are carrying live this COVID conversation, and we want to say thanks to the S Hotel again for hosting us, and of course to the members uh, who are out in um, technology world, is it, or Zoom world, who are listening in the media and others. Welcome to another COVID Conversations. We look forward to our regular Thursday evening conversation with the public, with the media. And I'm gonna remove my mask for clarity, just to say we have social distancing, so our physical distancing. Um, <clears throat> today we're gonna to discuss uh, an interesting uh, topic. It really is a convergence of public health issues at this time of year. COVID, of course, being the sort of elephant in the room, the, the current and very topical public health threat, which has essentially dominated conversation over the past um, seven, eight months at least. And we continue to respond, and this is the basis for our regular Thursday evening discussions uh, titled COVID Conversations. But uh, COVID, um, while a major challenge, uh, and even with the progress that we have made and are making, becomes a lot more challenging uh, if we encounter an upsurge in what we would normally have this time of year because of the rains, which is the AG's Egypti Index, dengue uh, cases. Last year, as you know, we had a, a, a full year of dengue outbreak, outbreak declared by the World Health Organization based on the numbers we had. We had a number of Jamaicans, tragically, who lost their lives, close to 80 Jamaicans. And uh, again, we are in the season where normally we see that index rise and the threat that it represents in terms of dengue. Uh, added to that, we are also in the flu season uh, and what that means too, given the severity of flu, particularly for segments of the population, COVID could become that much more challenging if we have a dengue challenge and a flu challenge at the same time. So today's conversation is really about how we prevent, how we jump ahead of, how we stave off, how we uh, manage the possibility of those public health issues affecting the population. And it's really not just up to us as public health officials, it really is up to the population to play its part. And that's the basis on which we will have a discussion here today. So we're trying to jump ahead of what could be a triple public health threat facing the population, COVID-19, dengue, and the flu. The triple threat is one that we must first and foremost be aware of 
and then make the necessary interventions to ensure the best public health outcomes for the people of Jamaica. Uh, if we are complacent, in addition to our COVID-19 cases, we could have, I am told by the experts, more than 300 dengue cases and three to five dengue deaths each week. This is a modeling that has been done, which we hope we will not realize, but it is possible. In addition to the influenza-like illnesses, which of course is the flu, that could make the numbers even greater. Um, we will have later on Dr. Karen Webster Carr, our national epidemiologist and acting chief medical officer, to elaborate on the possibility of what I would classify as a perfect storm if those three were to create a, 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 a scenario where the, the maximum impact on the population is realized. In terms of COVID-19, what are our current realities? We understand from the World Health Organization that in the past week, the highest number of new COVID-19 cases have been reported globally, amounting to over 2 million new cases in the past seven days, the shortest interval for this exponential increase since the start, since the start of the pandemic, while the number of new deaths is comparable to previous weeks. Uh, as of October 25th, the WHO has revealed that over 42 million cases and 1.1 million deaths have been reported globally, with over 2.8 million new cases and nearly 40,000 new deaths reported over the past week. Uh, this, ladies and gentlemen, is an indication that while we are making progress as a country and while we continue to work diligently, the fact is that COVID is still around, as we like to say, COVID still a keep, and not just in Jamaica, but in the world. And the globe is seeing a resurgence of COVID cases, which means we cannot be complacent. Here in Jamaica, our situation is that 76 new cases up to yesterday, October 28th, which puts the total number of cases over ever experienced over the period to 8,927 and four deaths, which bring the total number of COVID-19 related deaths for the island to 202. Uh, so we have passed the 200 mark. And again, we want to express our condolences to all persons who have been affected, family members, friends, uh, 202 Jamaicans have succumbed to the COVID virus, the COVID pandemic to date. And it is 202 too many from our perspective. In short, COVID is still out there, requiring continued vigilance in our national response to the disease, including the strict adherence to infection prevention and control measures. And so we repeat again, and I know repeat again for emphasis, uh, masking up, we must add the masks, washing the hands, keeping your physical distancing from others, and sticking to quarantine or isolation as is required. The Prime Minister announced a new set of orders recently. Last evening, he and I and others, other ministers, at a press briefing, and we want to emphasize, repeat, and state again that it is so important that as a country, as a people, we do not become complacent because we still have some journey yet to cover before we believe this COVID pandemic will be brought under control. But then there's dengue. In the last few weeks, we have seen significant rainfall uh, across the country. And in addition to the challenges of infrastructure, uh, blocked roads, uh, overflowing, flooding, leaking roofs, uh, all that accompanies a, a, a sort of long and persistent rainfall we have, from a public health perspective, the issues around uh, waterborne diseases. And in the case of uh, mosquito-borne diseases, the dengue threat is real. The Aegis aegypti mosquito is endemic to Jamaica. We'll never get rid of it. We can only control the population. And in controlling that population, we minimize the risk of the transmission of, of dengue. 
the risk level for transmission is currently assessed as, as low, and we want to be thankful for that. Um, the, all three ADES Egypt indices used for risk assessment remain relatively low from January to September of this year, but that could change depending on how we operate. The BRITU index, which looks at the number of mosquito-positive containers per 100 houses, is 17.8% from January to September, which means that for every 100 houses that we inspect and look for breeding sites, just under 18%, or 18 out of every 100, just to be very simplistic, we have found the Aegis aegypti mosquito breeding. And that 17.8% between January and September is actually lower than the similar period last year where we had 24%. And last year, as you know, we had the outbreak which we had to struggle to bring under control. So we are actually doing better than last year. At the same time, we are doing better than WHO's standard of approximately 20% during that period. So we are two percentage points less than what the WHO would consider to be tolerable. And that again requires some level of recognition and celebration. And I want to take the opportunity to thank the vector workers, the public health team in the field, uh, because they have played a big part in that regard. The Aedes in house index, which takes account of the percentage of houses infested with mosquito larvae, was at 9.4%. And therefore, for every 100 in-house inspection, just under nine and a half of those homes um, were, had the presence of the larvae, meaning breeding the mosquito in the house. We're talking about the vase that you keep on the whatnot, or the bucket that you might keep in the bathroom to store water because you don't have running water to flush the toilet, or the leaking pipe under the sink that you put a pan to catch because you didn't get a chance to fix the pipe, all of those things become breeding sites for mosquitoes and ultimately poses a, a risk to you. We are doing better than last year because we're last year this time we're at 11% and the WHO standard, however, is 5%. So we're not doing as well as what we should be doing to be considered relatively risk-free. The container index, which looks at the percentage of water holding containers infested with mosquito larvae, was at 6.6% compared to 8.7% in that uh, during the 2019 period. So again, doing better. So on all the indices, we can say we are as a people, as a country, doing better than last year. Not where we want to be, what's better than last year. And that is manifested in the low level numbers of dengue cases that we have in the country. And that again, is a very positive thing. And I'll get to the reason why I think this is the case shortly. Together, these indices provide us with a good indication of where we are, and we have to continue to increase the messaging to get Jamaicans to recognize the importance of destroying, searching and destroying breeding sites, and to ensure that they do what needs to be done. They tightly cover our water drums, so secure our water storage tanks, the, the searching the drums and mosquito breeding sites, including our, you know, all the things that I mentioned earlier. Once you see that little wiggly thing in the water, you know that mosquito's breeding in it. And you must watch out for that wiggly thing in the water and find a way to destroy it because that could represent the difference between your having dengue and severe case of dengue and not, and we must take that seriously. I think that we have done better this year than last because last year we had the single largest investment in vector control, infrastructure, and people than we have had in many, many years. I would be prepared to say decades before. Uh, we had in place over 1,244 vector control workers. 222 are permanent, so those are the ones on staff, but we engaged just over another 1,000, 1,022. Those are still in place, and they have been out in the field doing the work, bringing the messaging, giving out the brochures. We have had 60 new vehicles that have been assigned to the vector control program. 
36 of the 60 had vehicle-mounted foggers, the largest investment in public health infrastructure for vector management last year was made by the government. And I, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it as minister. I think the government should be proud of it. And I think the vector team in public health should be proud of that. And I believe the numbers that we're seeing now are reflective of that. The, the, the cost was just, over three, just under $300 million that was invested. We have 76 handheld fogging machines with another 35 in stock. So all of those, I think, plus the hard work of the people on the ground would have contributed. For the August to September alone, we fogged over 1,081 communities and 397 schools. And also, August to September, we held some 26 health education, education sessions, distributed 95,220 brochures, and we distributed to some 257,000 Jamaicans across the country. So the team has been working. Quickly, in terms of influenza, the third leg in the triple threat uh, of dengue, COVID, and influenza uh, is also at a stage where we are vulnerable. Both the flu and COVID-19 are caused, of course, by viruses, the flu by influenza virus and COVID-19 by the new coronavirus, they, are, they also share some symptoms which could become a challenge in distinguishing whether one has the flu or one has dengue, or, sorry, COVID. Fever, cough, runny or stuffy nose, shortness of breath, etc. Uh, and so it's very important that as citizens, if you have any of these symptoms, you get checked out by a doctor. And it's also important that you do not panic, but at least get the diagnosis to determine which of the two or indeed the three you may have. Um, uh, because depending on what you have, your treatment would vary. There is, however, one significant difference uh, for the flu as opposed to COVID, and that is there is a vaccine that you can take to protect you against the flu. And I want to use the opportunity to say that not many Jamaicans are interested in taking the flu vaccine. And I would certainly want to encourage um, those, particularly of a particular age cohort, to seek out, and you can get it done privately, the vaccine, because it certainly will assist in protecting you against the flu. Jamaica recently received a shipment of more than 23,000 doses of flu vaccine, uh, which are now being distributed across the health regions. And we continue to urge Jamaicans to get vaccinated. The priority for this vaccine would be healthcare workers initially, pregnant women, children over six months with chronic illnesses, non-health frontline workers, such as the police officers, army, correctional services, customs, and immigration officers and transport operators, institutionalized persons, those in the infirmaries, nursing homes, and the elderly, 65 years and older, and those with chronic illnesses. Uh, so all those persons, and, and indeed I would say parliamentarians too, persons or public officials, elected officials who are on the ground in the communities interfacing with a wide cross-section of the population they would represent a risk. And we have the 23,000 in the first instance. Now last year we had probably, I think it was 25,000. And I don't think half of those vaccines were used because even in the case of frontline workers, many persons shied away from taking the flu vaccine. And again, we want to say, take it if you have access to it. Seek it out if you are vulnerable because this triple threat that we face could be that much worse for you if you avoid the preventative methods and you end up getting one or a combination of the three. So it's very important that we, we, we do that for ourselves. Now, the head of the Family Health Unit, Dr. Mel Melody Ennis, will tell us a little more later on as it relates to the flu vaccine. I want to quickly shift, and I know I've been going on for a while. We still will maintain our hour and a half session, don't worry. 
but I think there's a lot of information here given the three, the triple threat that we spoke about. But I have to announce an additional measure that I think represents an advancement in the COVID response. And that is the approval, finally, and I say finally, and I exhale <laughs> when I say finally, um, of two private labs that are now able, with the sanctioning, the approval, and indeed the recommendation of the Ministry of Health to offer COVID-19 related tests. This has been long in the making, a lot of dialogue, but I'm happy to say that we are now at a point where the validation studies have been done, the standards have been established and verified. And the, the, the first one, Carigen and Microlabs, Carigen working with Microlabs, Microlabs having the distribution network across the country, Carigen being an entity based at the University Hospital of the West Indies, combined private sector entities are now able for a cost or for a fee to offer the PCR test for COVID with the sanctioning of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Um, and that was achieved this week based on a long period of discussions, testing and retesting, validation, and all of the other necessary steps to ensure that the public is protected and they get what they pay for from a public health standpoint. And so you can go to a micro labs and they're all over the country. You can get swabbed, samples collected, sent into Carigen, and Carigen will do the tests, turn it around and send back the results. The requirement is that this setup in the private space will require a reporting mechanism because from a public health standpoint, we need to know how many people are positive in the country, how many tests are done, how many are negative. That's critical for public health planning and for decision making at the highest possible level, including the level of cabinet and the government. But it is a major um, addition to the testing arrangements in the country no longer are persons required to only depend for the credibility of the process on the government entities, which would have been the Public Health Lab and UWI, but they can now, through microlabs or directly to Carigen, do their testing for a fee. Uh, and of course, this is a PCR test, which is the gold standard of tests um, that we are currently doing. In addition to that, the Ministry has also approved Technology Solutions Limited to do environmental testing. And what this means, um, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that this entity, Technology Solutions Limited, is able to go into your company or your home or wherever else in a public space and they can test surfaces to determine if the virus exists on those surfaces. So not testing the human body to determine the presence of the virus, but testing the countertops, the, the, the metal, the, the, the customer service area, the places that people move, the workstations, to see if the virus is present. And the Ministry of Health and Wellness, through the public health lab team, have validated the work of Technology Solutions Limited. This again is a major addition to the testing arrangements in the country. And I want to use the opportunity firstly to thank the Public Health Lab, Dr. Hamilton and her team for the work that they have done, uh, supported of course by the Office of the um, CMO, Chief Medical Officer and the PS and others. I want to thank the private sector entities for their patience and their cooperation and just to say, we have always been supportive of the public-private partnership approach as part of the COVID response. In the weeks to come, we will announce, I hope, additional collaboration between private entities as it relates to the antigen tests, where currently a number of labs, at least eight, are undergoing training with the Pan American Health Organization and our public health team 
so that they can in fact source the antigen test, which is a shorter turnaround time test, more conducive under certain circumstances to determine whether you are positive for COVID or not. When that happens, it will solve substantially the delays that we have had to deal with as it relates to testing and the turnaround for testing results. And so I'm very happy to report um, on that. The last several months, ladies and gentlemen, for many of us have seen the longest months of our lives as we have had to face the most significant health threat of our time. We have had to retreat indoors and pull our children from classrooms as we have compulsively washed our hands, sanitized surfaces, done masks when we venture into public spaces. Now we are being told that COVID-19 is not only a threat, but we have dengue and the flu at our doorsteps. However, knowledge is power, and our awareness of this triple threat is the first step to victory. The next step is to do what we know needs to be done and can be done to protect ourselves and the people we care about. And so on behalf of the Ministry of Health and Wellness as Minister and the Government of Jamaica, the Honourable Prime Minister and the Cabinet, I want to say to us, we have it in us to overcome these threats. We are resilient, we are smart, we seek out information. Uh, Jamaica is more connected and Jamaicans are more connected, I believe, than any other. One former minister, God rest his soul, said we have multiple cell phones to call it ourselves if we need to. But we certainly have access to internet, to the global space, the local information. I really am urging Jamaicans. We're doing well. We're doing well despite the unfortunate loss of lives. Follow the protocols. What we do not want is to be overwhelmed as a public health response where people don't have access to hospital beds, doctors, nurses, if they need it because of a dengue, a flu outbreak, or indeed COVID. And I think we, we can do that. And I certainly urge us to work on that. And that's why today is so important as part of the COVID conversation. Okay. I think I've chatted you out for a very long time, so I'm going to ask the, the our regional epidemiologist, Dr. Ung. Is that the right pronunciation? Correct, sir. Ung. Ong. What's your nationality? Bamis. Huh? You Bamis. Turn, on your, turn on your mic. Yeah. It's not on when it's green, no. yeah? What? Bamis. Bamis. Bur Burmese. Yes. Okay, and you've been, but, but very clear, you've been working with a, this Western region for how long? Uh, maybe 22, 23 years. 23 years? Correct. So you should say Burmese Jamaica, <laughs> right? Naturalized, yes. Anyway, so we're happy to have you. And you're going to give us a very, very short five minutes since we're in the West um, on the region and the state of the region as it relates to COVID. And then we go right into Dr. Webster Carr. So I'm going to ask her to be a little patient with us. Um, so go ahead, Doc, and, and give us quickly. And you, I think you have some slides up, right? Yes. Tell us what's happening. And by the way, the region is St. James, Hanover, Trelawney, and Westmoreland. Westmoreland. Correct. Okay, go ahead quickly. Okay, thank you so much, Minister, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Stephen? Next slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, as at October 28, 2020, we have a total of 1,365 COVID-19 positive cases reported. That's the 15% of the total positive identifying in Jamaica. Of those number, 74% uh, or 1,014 persons have already recovered, and 236 or 23% are still uh, active and being managed. Sadly, we have lost 53 Jamaicans to COVID-19 related illnesses. And we also have 65% or 5% repatriated during that time. Next. In terms of breakdown by parishes, we have St. James reported most of the cases with 859 um, cases with 63% of the total in the region, followed by 216 or 16% of the total and 11% or 154 cases reported in Trelawney 
and 136 or 10% reported in Hanover, parish of Hanover. Um, all, yeah, all, all those reported um, between 72 or 75% of those cases are, have already recovered. Next. Describing the epidemiology of COVID-19 cannot be done without um, showing the epic curve. The date of onset or the date the sign and symptoms of COVID-19 is uh, started to show in a patient is used to plot this figure. And as you can see, um, all four parishes at the beginning of the October, we have seen increased number of cases reported in all four parishes and trending down, except Wasmola. Uh, we have still seen the increased uh, number of cases reported in that particular parish and it's being monitored closely. Next. In terms of uh, distribution of age and sex, generally for the Western region of four parishes, uh, female reported, um, reportedly infected more than male counterpart with 55, uh, 54%. And in terms of age distribution between 20 and 30, 39-year age groups, age groups are most affected with COVID-19. Next. In terms of the distribution by individual parish, next. Westmoreland and St. James are showing the similar trend. Uh, more female are affected than male. Um, uh, between 20 and 39 age groups are affected most in both parishes. Next. For Trelawney and Hanover, those two parishes show slightly different in terms of age distribution, but sex distribution uh, is similar to what you see in the uh, gen um, general uh, regional picture. But for both parishes, we are also, while we see 20 to 39 age groups affected most, and we also see 50 to 59 age groups are also reported being infected with COVID-19. Next. Most deaths reported in the age group 50 year and over, but of note, we also have some deaths reported in 30 to 49 age group in Western region. Next. Next. So in public health, what we use is targeted intervention. That's something that we use in one of our strategies. And we have to identify where these cases are coming from and their location. So this is the map which shows that persons who, are, who were tested positive for COVID-19 between October 14 to October 28. In other words, those persons are identified as active cases and also they are infectious. So we need to properly manage these individuals so that we can stop the spread from that individual to the rest of the communities. In uh, Hanover, we have uh, Sandy Bay, uh, hope well those areas. I can remember another one. Next one, please. For St. James, the concentration of the cases are identified in South Spring, Cornwall Court, and Borg Village, and we also identify some location in other areas. But as you can see, not all the communities in St. James are being infected. Uh, uh, confirmed case, uh, active cases are identified in not all the communities. We have some communities where we are going to be doing the targeted intervention. Next. For Trelawney, uh, some communities are being infected, but um, most, uh, the, the majority of the uh, cases are uh, reported between four to nine cases per community. Next. For Westmoreland, the distribution seems to be throughout the parish, but they have reported between four to nine uh, cases in one particular community. Next. So what are we doing and what are we planning to do using these maps and evidence? And we are using the all agency approach and targeting those communities with active cases. Uh, we are mobilizing the community persons, community leaders and other agencies and trying to sensitize those individuals and those community and we do the intervention. And being of our Ministry of Health and Wellness, our Minister of Health is heading that uh, particular intervention and activities. For health now, um, for specific to health sector, we are uh, managing our beds um, in our improvement in terms of quality of care and also increase in bed capacity to manage those case persons who need to be hospitalized with COVID-19 cases in our, uh, in our hospitals and government facilities. 
uh, by way of doing that, we would like to protect our healthcare workers who are considered frontline workers and also uh, persons who are at high risk of contracting COVID-19 and ended up with the serious form of COVID-19 cases, such as persons who are in from infirmaries, daycare centers and nursing homes and lockups. Um, to do that, we have to have evidence. By way of collecting information and evidence, we have enhanced surveillance, uh, particularly on fever and respiratory illnesses. Uh, we are doing on communities. We are collecting information daily from hotels, uh, institutions, the one that I mentioned previously, on both private and public facilities. COVID-19 also had brought up to the infection control practices, importance of the infection control practices, and especially at healthcare facilities. So those are being highlighted. And sometimes you have to repeat the uh, message so that person can absorb. So continuation with the sensitization and reinforcing our health messages and also monitoring uh, of the workplace and institution as to whether or not they are following infection control practices and procedures. Um, also, we are expanding capacity to manage the patient with COVID-19, and we are also establishing the field hospital and pharma um, area, and I know Minister went to that area this morning. Next. Um, if you live in St. James or one of those um, areas, or even you live outside of Western region, if you are concerned COVID-related situation, these are the number that you can call. With that, I'm going to close. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ong. And listen, I understand and I just learned that your, your mom passed today. And I want to express my condolences to you on behalf of the public health family. I didn't know. And you've made it out here to work in the interest of Jamaican. So please accept our condolences and our prayers are with you and your family. Thank you so much, Prince. All right. Um, uh, we also have on to my uh, left, Dr. Johnson Campbell, who is the Medical Officer of Health for St. James. I'm just going to give her two minutes while Dr. Webster Carr t t um, tunes up or uploads her information. Uh, just touch your mic there to Green and tell us how, how, what is your assessment of the dengue flu and the covid as it relates to underground work in the community. Is, is the public aware? How are you approaching this more difficult task in the context of COVID? Thank you very much, Minister. Good afternoon to everyone. Certainly, the th triple threat is a concern for all of us, but um, the public health measures are in place to help us to, to get through this. So you will have persons who will... Um, because all the symptoms overlap and they seem to be the same and you're not quite sure what it is. And we have persons calling into our center and they complain of the illness and you're not sure whether it is dengue or it is COVID. We want to, first of all, make sure that it is not COVID. So when you call in, we assess you and um, schedule you for testing at our testing site. And... Um, Hope that you'll get back. We advise you to remain in quarantine until you can get back your results. Are you hearing me clearly? Um, for having ruled out COVID, then we may want to assess for the other things, such as whether it is dengue, especially if they have retroorbital pain, headache, and back pain. Um, but we want to know that the messages continue the same way. Um, if it is that you are having any of these illnesses, you can begin with the over-the-counter medication of something for the fever, something for the pain, while avoiding, remember we always say, avoid the NSAIDs such as the Voltaren, the Cataflam, and you stick to the things such as the Paracetamol, Make sure that you're well hydrated. Um, and certainly, if it is that you're not responding to the initial measures, you call us and we'll facilitate you being seen at one of our health facilities or at the hospital. We want to say to homeowners, especially if you're in, you know, when there's a crisis, always take opportunities of a crisis. So the persons who are home in quarantine, sorry, 
the persons who are home in quarantine, use the opportunity to, to look at what is happening in your home. Look for breeding sites at home. You can, if you're home alone, you can go out in your yard, right? Use the opportunity to identify breeding sites and um, eliminate them as best as possible. We will be moving in with our task workers. Um, you may not have seen much of them in, a, in the last couple of weeks. And then with the rainfall, we have not been able to go out, but certainly we will be coming out in our numbers to assist you in identifying and destroying breeding sites. But we ask all householders, take the opportunity to look for these things and eliminate them. We need your help. We cannot do it on our own. So as a ministry, we emphasize partnership and collaboration. We say to community groups in a safe manner, work together to um, identify and eliminate breeding sites. We're not looking at large gatherings now, but we can have smaller groups of people working together to eliminate breeding sites. Thank you very much, um, Doc. And we, that's a message that we have to keep repeating so that we can get it in the psychic of all. Uh, we're happy that many Jamaicans are following, but too many are not. All right, so we're going to move now quickly into Dr. Webster, Karen Webster Carr, our Principal Medical Officer, National Epidemiologist, and the Acting CMO. Dr. Webster Carr, you're, you're uploaded and ready to go. Please give us your assessment of what's happening. So we're going to look, as usual, on the situation as we are today. Um, we have 8,927 confirmed cases. The ma vast majority are locally acquired. We have had 716 cases, new cases, between the period October 14th to 28th. So this is the, we heard about epidemiological curve already from Dr. Ong, and this is a national epidemiological curve. On the red line is a seven day moving average. And so this is based on the onset of symptoms of person, not when the cases have been confirmed. So in essence, there's, seems to be a gradual decrease in cases in general. Um, so this is looking optimistic, but if, if things change, um, it could go, we could have a sharp increase again, and that we will be started at a higher point or level, and it could increase dramatically. When we look at the positivity rates, we have been showing this for the last two weeks. Um, we peaked uh, over 25% or just about 25% and we have been decreasing steadily. Between last week and so far this week, it seemed about the same. Last week, this time we were at 12%. So it's around the same. Um, right now. So we also looked at superimposing this curve on some of, some of the COVID measures. So we looked at the curfew hours and we looked at the quarantine time and how the number of cases changed over time. And hopefully it's, it's self-explanatory. But quarantine, um, there has been some community quarantine as soon as there are um, increasing cases or sharp increasing cases in particular communities, there has been uh, quarantine activities or some modification of the curfew hours and actions on the ground. And so this is what has been helping to maintain the decreasing cases that we have seen. Of course, what has not been mentioned here because we don't have the numbers, but the, in, the use of masks, physical distancing, hand washing and hand sanitization are important measures that 
continues and we have to enforce these measures and infection prevention and control measures at all times. When we look at, so we're going to look at the geographic distribution now. When we look at the country and the parishes, cumulatively, so the total cases since the outbreak of COVID-19, KC and St. James have had the highest rate, number of cases per population. When we bring it a bit more recent over the last two weeks and the more infectious cases among the actives, St. James has the highest rate of active cases, number of active cases per population. And then we look at, at how we move over time with cases. We looked, last week we introduced this chart, looking at the trends, so week on week. If you are between the last two weeks, if you have had an increasing trend, you have a red. If one week decrease or the same, you are considered in the yellow. And if you have two weeks decreasing trend, you are the lighter green. And if nobody has it this week, but if you have three weeks decreasing trend, then you would be in the, a little darker green. So this is what it looks like around the country, looking at the geography and the time. Um, so this is, we're taking the community map over time, since July to the current, um, since to last, to, yes, last week. And this is how it has changed over time. The number of communities, the number of cases that have been impacted by COVID-19. And this is a 16 weeks most six, recent 16 weeks, and we see how it has changed over time. In August to September, the number of cases and communities involved was pretty high, and it has decreased somewhat, but not where we were in July at all. And so we are still having significant number of cases in a number of communities. When we look at the top 20 communities, and in particular, the communities, the active cases in the last um, two weeks, these are the communities that are came out on top. St. James, the Greater Montego Bay area, and the downtown Kingston area are the areas of greatest concern. Let's turn a little bit to the deaths. Um, so we have had, um, as mentioned before, 202 deaths, and this is the distribution by time for, the, for these deaths. So the blue line tells you the onset of the symptoms of the person who died. And then the red line gives you the time, the week of occurrence of the death. Men are significantly more likely to die than uh, females. Um, and then as age increases, the case fatality rate increases. When we look at the deaths, the case fatality rate by parish, uh, St. Elizabeth, St. Mary, and Westmoreland had the highest case fatality rate. The number of deaths over the, um, the number of cases. When we look at number of deaths 
per population, then St. Mary had the highest deaths per population followed by St. James. So we spoke about the three diseases, dengue, COVID-19, and influenza. So we looked at the 2018, 2019, 2020 period, and this tells you where we are. Um, we've not seen at this time a lot of dengue. And the number of influenza-like illnesses has decreased. In the blue are the COVID-19 cases. And um, the blue line represents the deaths. So, we said it's the time of the year that we usually see dengue, influenza, and if you really think about it, gastroenteritis. And um, if we should say, take out the number, look at the number of cases that we had for dengue last year and influenza-like illness and transpose it and put it on to the rest of the year, then the lighter shade is what we would have. And um, this would be significant challenges on the health system with more admissions and, and more deaths. So um, we know that the actions for COVID is the same action for influenza. So if we try our best to continue the downward trend, then we should have a good end of year for both COVID and influenza. Dengue, I think that has been discussed um, a lot during this period. So this is what we have at this time, and we, we hope, hopefully, we will not see this trend for the rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Webster Carr. Um, as usual, very thorough and very helpful presentation. I want to commend the epidemiologist and her team across the country for really keeping us abreast through charts and diagrams and and, and graphs as to what is happening, much easier to understand. The, the core of the message here is that COVID-19 still remains the elephant in the room, the, the greatest threat. The other two to date are not nearly as, as significant in, its, in their impact. However, it is still early, and so we cannot take for granted the possibility. And if we were to have the perfect storm of the triple threat, then what it would mean is that the health system would come under significant pressure, and that's not what we want. So while we now um, upload the influenza perspective by Dr. Melanie Ennis, the Director of Family Health Services, is she online now? So we're gonna go right into her presentation, uh, a very short presentation, but nevertheless, will give us a sense of where we are as it relates to the influenza or flu, as many of us refer to it and what the risks are and what we need to do. Dr. Ennis. Good evening, Minister. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so very much. We are approaching the flu season. It begins in November of each year and it extends to March. However, it can be a little longer from October all the way up to May. Now, we have with us COVID this year. It means that persons who become infected and affected by the influenza virus may have a difficulty in recognizing if they have COVID or they have influenza. But as was stated earlier, the influenza can be prevented via the vaccine. We here in Jamaica received our 
vaccine shipment just last week and we are distributing. So we should have the vaccine in our facilities in short order. Now we have prioritized the groups of persons who should receive the vaccine. However, we are encouraging all Jamaicans, if you can, please seek out and do get the influenza vaccine. It's important to receive this vaccine because during this time, it will one, shorten the duration of any flu-like illness that you may get. The severity will certainly be lessened. The hospitalization will be decreased. So those are at least three benefits to getting the influenza vaccine. Minister stated earlier, the persons who we would be vaccinating at our health facilities or pregnant women or healthcare workers or non-health frontline workers, the persons in the army, the constabulary force, our immigration officers, etc., children with chronic illnesses, our elderly over 65 also with chronic illnesses are persons who we have prioritized to vaccinate this flu season. We should also be mindful that we can get the flu and COVID together. And even if you get one, it does not prevent you from getting the other. Also important for us to recognize is the fact that there is no evidence to date that has suggested that if we get the flu vaccine, it will in any way make us more susceptible to getting COVID. What has been shown when we look at what occurred in the Southern hemisphere for their winter season, it was shown that persons who received the flu vaccine, actually, if they got COVID, their impact of the illness was much less and they also had less deaths in persons who had received the vaccine. So the vaccine that we have here in country for our most vulnerable certainly will protect us from, uh, from se the severity of the illness of COVID and certainly definitely from the flu. We remember that there is, for the symptoms of the flu, they appear a little bit earlier. So it is usually within two days of being infected and you do get your very high fever, the headache, the cough. The cough can be persistent. It can also be dry, the runny nose uh, and the generalized weakness and fatigue. Now, also from the Southern region, uh, the Southern hemisphere's flu season, we were able to learn that not as many persons caught the flu because of what? We were practicing masking up, we were covering our cough and, and, and sneezing, we were social distancing, and all of that helped to lessen the number of persons that got affected and infected in the Southern Hemisphere. So we are anticipating, we are hoping that our population are most vulnerable. The persons in the at-risk group will certainly make contact with the health department, the local health centers, so that they can be vaccinated. We can prevent the spread of the flu, we can lessen the impact severity of the flu. And even if we do get COVID, we can also lessen the impact. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, really appreciate the contribution. Dr. Ennis, who is the Director of Family Health Services. I think the main issue that was worth repeating here while uh, Mr. Everton Baker, our Project Manager for Enhanced Dengue Program is uploaded to the screen. Uh, I think the major issue here is that the flu vaccine uh, is available, available to frontline workers across the country through our health centers and hospitals. We now have uh, over 20, what, 23,000 in stock. I think it's also important to note that 
persons can otherwise access the vaccine privately, consult with your doctor who can give you some directive as to where if they don't have it. And thirdly, and perhaps very important, well, more importantly, is that evidence has shown, at least preliminarily anyway, in countries where the flu vaccine is more a norm than an exception, that persons who have had the flu vaccine and contract COVID uh, are likely to have less severe, uh, there, there's a less severe impact uh, because of the vaccine. Now, I, I don't have any study, but I'm listening to what Dr. Ennis said earlier, and she's saying based on what has transpired in other parts of the world where the flu vaccine is, is, is administered and persons who are most vulnerable um, contract COVID. So it, 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 you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of benefits from taking the flu vaccine, and we certainly want to encourage that as part of the overall response, both COVID response and the flu response. Mr. Everton Baker, you're the man on the ground as it relates to the vector control and management, and Dengue is in the spotlight, which means you're in the spotlight. In five minutes or less, tell us exactly what's happening there. Um, Thank you very much, Minister. Well, um, the Vector Control Program really is a sustained program. And as Minister said, the most important um, vector is the Aedes aegypti, which is endemic to Jamaica, which we are trying to ensure that is kept under control because the Aedes aegypti will spread not just dengue, but other viruses like chicken gunia, among others. We recognize that we have a task to do, so we have adequate vehicles. In fact, we have over 85 vehicles, 60 new ones in the field, and we have adequate human resource. In fact, we have moved the program from five days of intervention to seven days per week. And this is part of our enhanced strategy at this time of the year, starting from about July, and we ensure that we step up the game to keep ahead of the, the, the reduction, the source reduction. And by source reduction, I mean the officers, the vector control workers are out in their numbers and they are moving from premises to premises. In fact, we have done 1.9 million visits. And of that 1.9 million visits, we have found 187,000 of those premises to be positive for AIDS, which is about 9.4%, as you would have heard. So we the, the work continues on a sustained basis and we have adequate supplies in terms of insecticide and larvicide we have a tablet that is used in the drums and other containers that is very effective in keeping the mosquitoes we have a drum cover we have a, a nice drum cover that is used and it is in the community as well and you community members can purchase these their um, drum covers and you can use other methods of control in the 80s. We, we ramped up our public relations program and that to, to, to resensitize and ensure that persons are aware of what is happening and what is their role. Now, in, in, in just summing up, I just want to say our most important um, thing is the partnership we have, not just with the agencies, but with the people, with the community-based organization. Because we are saying when the ministry would have done, would have spent over $300 million to just buy vehicles and um, machines, we, the budget is far be, larger than that. And we can only be successful if, we, if the people in the community would play their role and play their part by just destroying the breeding sites and, and keep doing it. And once we do that, we are going to have a reduced indices. Different indices are going to be very small so even if we have the aid, uh, dengue virus circulating, it, the risk of transmission is going to be very low. I want to thank you and thank the public for their part they have played in last year's sustained program and how they, they, they joined with us so that we could have um, brought this situation under control. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Baker. And I know you had to rush because we're, we're against time, but keep stay in line just in case we need you for any questions. Um, I hear you. I, I had given you the information before. We're doing better this year than last in terms of our indices. We have the infrastructure, we have the people, we have the material. But in your, very importantly, your last statement around the people's engagement, yeah, I continue to emphasize is absolutely critical. Persons need to observe the protocols of destroying breeding sites in and around the home. 
because as you like to say, I think you said, what, is 60, 70 percent of our breeding sites that are a problem are in and around the home, right? Right, sir. Jones is a Very major. much so. So we need to make sure we do that. Thanks again. And um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask Stephen to go straight into the questions now. Stephen. Thank you very much, Minister. Just reminding our colleagues on Zoom, the media colleagues on Zoom, to use the raised hand feature and to introduce yourself and your media entity. We're going to begin with Brittany Clark. Okay, good evening, everyone. Are you hearing me clearly? Go ahead, Brittany. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, with regards to the perfect storm that uh, we're unfortunately preparing for at this time, uh, how equipped can you say the health facilities are to deal with the, po the possibility of the triple threat? Uh, was, it was it factored into the, factored into the budget, rather, given that it, you know, it is a likely possibility? And with regards to the numbers, um, since the onset of COVID-19, do you have any record of how many dengue fever cases have been recorded? And has there been an increase or decrease since the onset of the heavy showers? And do you have any record of what areas uh, we can see these cases being reported? And just a question for a previous pre presenter, how soon can we begin seeing these vector control measures in place, given that you know we've just received those heavy showers and breeding sites right. are becoming more bad? Right. So you have asked about six questions uh, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but you're good at what you do, and I want to commend you. Um, the, the challenge, the, the issue of budget, Brittany, is, is not an issue at this time, to be totally frank. I think the government recognizes the importance of the public health response. They have, the government, the cabinet has delivered on the COVID response. Um, I spoke to Dengue as it relates to vector control, and last year the government delivered on the infrastructure build-out and the hiring of people. That's all in place now, and they are active and in the field. And the government has delivered, as it relates to the flu, as it relates to the 23,000 doses of vaccines that are here and are being distributed, and we are encouraging persons to comply and to take them, take up the, the vaccine. So, from a budgetary standpoint, we're not we're, we're not short in any way at this time. Um, the numbers are suggesting too that we're not in a crisis, certainly as it relates to dengue or flu and we are responding as the cases arise and we are in a position to respond similarly from the hospital perspective um, there is no overflow or there is no shortage of beds at this point so this is in a sense what we're doing here is a preemptive strike we're saying we want to avoid the triple threat we want to avoid that perfect storm um, and what we're doing is advising the public to play their part in anticipation that depending on what we all do, we could avoid it and we can avoid it. As it relates to the question around the vector team and out in the field, we are out in the field. I was in Trelawney today, we met with the team just before them being deployed and that has not stopped and in fact, as Mr. Baker said earlier, our vector um, enhanced dengue program project manager. The truth is that um, the, we have no, now moved to a seven day rotation. So the, the team is out there seven days a week, in some cases morning and evenings to deal with the program. And that is worthy of note because it means that we're taking it very seriously. Um, I want to use the opportunity to again uh, say to the public that not all the time do we get a warm welcome when we come into the communities. I'm understanding that we had a stoning event in Manchester. I'm not sure where the community is, but I'd love to name the community, kind of name and shame, if you will, because they're out there doing their best to protect us, and persons are retaliating aggressively and in a dangerous way against the measures, and that's not something that we're going to countenance. I want to encourage persons well, thanks for those questions. Um, next. Thank you, Minister. We're going to go to Alfia Saunders from Jamaica Observer. Okay, good evening. I have two questions. Um, the first one is about the, the recent rains. Um, the 
impact on hospitals. I saw some footage on the weekend of a hospital. I think it was Spanish Town Hospital being flooded. Are there any formal reports from the ministry as to that situation across the island? And the 80,000 antigen test kits that we received, how many of those have been used and when is the next shipment coming in? We thank you very much for that. Firstly, we did a review of the, the hospital or the health infrastructure across the country after the rains. I asked for that review to be, come, to be done. I have not received any reports of any major damage. Um, the rains are still coming, by the way. I, I was in St. Catherine, West Central, last yesterday, and I mean, it was raining heavily and a lot of water. So the review is ongoing and things may change, but as of now, we're, we're, we're happy to say that we're not suffering any significant damage. There have been some leaks in one or two places. I know that the University Hospital of the West Indies had some leaks in, a, in one area. I know that um, Spanish Town, as you correctly pointed out, had a flooding situation at the front. The follow-up information on the issues have been that corrective measures have been taken. In case of Spanish Town, it was a, a, a blocked drainage um, a dra an area, and that was cleared. And I was subsequently sent, not too long after, a picture of the same area where the water was no longer present. So, you know, I think the team has responded, and, uh, you know, nature has not caused us too much discomfort from a public health perspective, infrastructure perspective. And we, we, we will continue to monitor in light of the fact that we expect um, more rains. The second part of the question was the antigen test. So we received, I'm told, about 24 or 25,000 uh, units of the 80,000, which I think was carried in the media recently. Uh, the rest is to come and to come soon. The, in the meantime, the deployment of the kits in the public health system, because this initial set would be deployed through the health centers and hospitals, will, be the, will also be, will accompany the completion of the training for persons to use the kits, use the tests, the public health team that is. And the training is taking place as we speak. They had a session last week. I think they should have some sessions this week. And this training is being done by PAHO. So we're not going to administer the test until the training is complete. And we're comfortable that it can be administered properly, adequately. And the responses have, the, the results would have the integrity that we would want to have. But I suspect it will be done over the next week or so. Um, that's my in, in information. Next question. Uh, thank you. We're going to go to Cassius Watson from Jamaica Social. Are you hearing me now? Hearing me? Yes, go ahead, please. Hello? Yes. yes. Um, I have uh, two questions. Um, one for the for Mr. Mr. Baker. Um, I can recall um, over my years of life um, when it when it came around to the rainy season and vector control that there would be some form of announcement, whether in the paper or via radio or some word would have gotten out to say that you would be coming in particular communities in particular areas, um, because then it was said that people needed to open their windows or leave their windows and doors open during the, the fogging process so that you know, mosquitoes or whatever inside can, can be you know, affected as well. Um, is there, is, does that still pertain? Do you do that, any form of, 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 of telling people that you know, you're coming to this particular era? Is there any, anywhere in the ministry's bulletins that this is done? That's, that's one question. The other question is to the, the chief epidemiologist, Dr. Karen Webster Carr, regarding, um, I'm noticing, just looking at the numbers that you supply on a daily basis, that in the past week or so, we're now seeing imported cases popping up again, um, which means that that's not, a, that, which means obviously speaks to what we're seeing in the United States where things are literally getting out of control and they're heading back to 
what's seemingly looking like a lockdown. Um, what type of adjustments I suspect will Jamaica be better prepared for this type of, 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 of monitoring or what are you doing to prepare to be on top of Jamaicans bringing the virus back in as we've obviously opened our airports for months now. Thank you very That's much. It. Thank you very much. Um, is, is, is Dr. Websakar still online? Or, yes. Dr. Websakar, the issue of imported cases, I know we're doing a lot to manage that. Do you want to quickly comment on that? No? Yeah, go ahead, quickly. The public health action is quarantine and proper quarantine. So if persons entering the country need to ensure that they quarantine for the 14 days and stay by themselves so they don't transmit it. Because we will get imported cases. What we don't want is a trans onward transmission. And that action is quarantine. And we all have to work together to ensure that happens. Thank you. And I think to add to that, we are introducing new arrangements around testing for tourists and for business persons. And those are going to ensure that we manage the possibility of importation, as well as the protocols that exist on the ground. Remember I said, I've been saying long and consistently, there's no silver bullet in preventing COVID spread. It's a combination. So whether you're a tourist or a business person or a local, the mask wearing is standard and requirement. This physical distancing, the sanitization, and those are going to be continuously repeated and the enforcement um, supported. Uh, in terms of Mr. Baker and the, 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 the town criers and the notification, I think that continues. But Mr. Baker, you want to just confirm that that is the case? Yes, sir. And the, the schedule are placed on the website. So we have the town criers that go in some in the regions and in the parishes okay. from time to time and those are known. Thank you. Next question. I'm going to go to Christopher Thomas from the Gleaner. Hello, good evening. Christopher yeah. Thomas from the Gleaner here. Are you all hearing me? Yes, yes go very ahead. good. Okay. The whole matter of the trip triple threat that we have here now. Because I, I am I'm looking specifically on Montego Bay. We have a triple threat of COVID, um, the flu and dengue. But what I what I would like to hear from those of your members who are out west, there is a particular problem with places like the People's Arcade where we have uh, um, issues over the years with improper garbage disposal and drain issues that contribute to breeding of mosquitoes and other pests. Yeah. And across the, the, anyway. the rest of the parish, because we're looking at St. James as being one of those high-risk parishes right now. But what, what needs to be done or what can be done at this stage to deal with those issues, particularly in that place that I mentioned, People's Arcade, and other places where we have issues with garbage disposal that could contribute to um, dengue spreading. Okay, I'm going to ask Dr. Johnson Campbell to quickly respond to that as a public health um, medical officer of health in St. James. Thank you very much for that question. Um, we work with our partners to get the job done. So we work with solid waste, we work with the municipal corporation. During this time, especially of um, enhanced monitoring for COVID, we are flooding the Montego Bay Business District. And so in collaboration with the police, our inspectors have been going and we are going through um, inspecting places and seeking to will serve notices where necessary, prosecute if necessary, and seeking to remedy the issues that are out there. But we require everybody to partner with us to get the job done. Thank you very much. Next question. Go to Emma Lewis. Hi, good evening, everyone. 
Um, I have two why questions, um, but I think the first one has been partly answered. I was going to ask, why are, why are we seeing such a big spike in St. James now? Are there specific reasons for that? And then my second why question was, why are more men dying from COVID-19 than women? I think this is not just in Jamaica, but I think it's a general thing, but I'm pondering why. I think that's a, a global question. Um, um, I have one more question. Do you have any updates on mustard seed communities where there were some cases? Thank you. Um, okay, the, the issue of St. James and why it's more cases, I think that's Maybe Dr. Webster Carr, you, you want to, I think you probably answered that. You want to comment any, any more on that? Based on the national overview. Dr. Webster Carr? No? Yes, I'm here. You, I, I don't think I can answer further on, on why St. Saint, Saint James um, is seen. It's. Um, I don't have a, okay. a reason. What about what about men? Why more men than, than women dying? That okay. is That's something that just globally, and uh, why I, I don't know the reason why. And even we control for in Jamaica, we looked at we did analysis on our our numbers, mm -hmm. and so when we um adjusted for age and underlying conditions, men were still significantly more likely to die than women. Um, I don't know if it has anything to do with, with, with the biology, but um, this is what we have seen so far. But the life expectancy of women is probably a year or two more than men, right? In Jamaica, that is. Dr. Webster my my marketing days of, of, of University of the West it is teaching, I, I think that's what the case is. I think it's 73 versus 75 or something like that. So men are actually expected based on, I suspect lifestyle has a lot to do with it. Um, we probably drink too much and smoke more than women and stress ourselves out more, I don't know. I mean, I'm speculating. I probably should withdraw all of those quote-unquote expert positions <laughs> as a non-expert in the matter. But um, it, it is a fact, it is a fact, the data does suggest that men are, are in fact, you know, more likely to suffer extreme um, cases and, uh, you know, it may be a warning to men to be careful and to be extra careful. Maybe our women are more cautious, more careful. Dr. Websakar. Not hearing you. We have to do with seeking care early, uh -huh. as as women are more likely to know that they have underlying condition, mm -hmm. as well as the control of the underlying condition. So these are learning lessons for all of us. Ensure that we control our um, underlying condition, our non-communicable diseases would be important in, right. in the control. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. On the issue of mustard seed, we have no additional updates. Um, last update I have is that we were we had made significant progress. If there is anything else, we will we will make the announcement. And the final question you said you have? Question comes from Doreen Luton from the Star. Yes, good evening, Minister and your team. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions, Minister. One, it's been more than a month that you announced that you, you would be doing legislative changes yourself and um, Delroy Chuck's ministry in relation to mask wearing, ticketing mm -hmm. for mask wearing. We have not heard anything on that. Can you give us an indication of why it's taking so long, how soon it is expected to come, and what the penalty provisions um, contemplated therein? And secondly, based on the trajectory, um, it appears the cases are, um, they're 
fewer um, by the day as the days go by. Can you indicate whether there's any likelihood that the entertainment community could get a reprieve this Christmas? All right, so you, you, the, on, the, on the first question, I have to defer to the Minister of Justice and the AG's department because they are the ones who are, have been charged, or, uh, and rightly so, by the Honorable Prime Minister to conclude on the, the legislative adjustments. I, I know they're working on it, and I anticipate an announcement soon, and I will, I will have to defer to them uh, until such times because we have not signed off as yet. But the intention is to have the clarity in law so that the enforcement can be a lot clearer because we are committed to the wearing of masks in public spaces because we think it's the right thing to do. And clinically, it does offer protection. Um, and we have seen that in, in, in where, it is, where it is the case. As it relates to the entertainment community, um, you know, we are seeing encouraging signs, which is very positive uh, and is a tribute to all of us, not just the public health team, but the frontline workers and indeed the country, that the numbers are tapering off and we are seeing now more recovered cases than positive cases and a, and a slowing in the positivity rate generally. Uh, you know, Christmas is still a little way off and, and the ideal scenario is to get Christmas um, representing what we traditionally are accustomed to, meeting our family and friends, relaxation, enjoyment, and all of the other things. Uh, but in public health, we remain cautious. And in the context of COVID, we take it one day at a time. And I might be liberal to say one week at a time, but I'm not prepared to say much more than that. Um, so we are managing the process, observing the process. There are some factors that we have control over. There are others that we don't. Um, if you look to the north, you will see cases, as I said in my opening, that are higher than before. We have to be very cautious, very careful, that we watch those cases carefully because Christmas is also a time of travel and a time of family members and friends coming back home, which we welcome. But if you have significant cases in those marketplaces or those jurisdictions, then it could pose a threat or a risk to the population. Then we have our own circumstances here that we have to manage. What I would say is that Jamaicans should continue to observe the orders that have been put out. Continue to lead by example, each and every one of us, and let us continue to manage the virus and indeed the possibility of the triple threat. And in a few weeks, two, three weeks, if we see the benefits of that investment in managing the process, I believe that there could be a basis to say to cabinet, ultimately it's the cabinet's decision, we can relax the levers to allow for a, a good Christmas. Um, and I think the government is well prepared to do that because we understand the disruptions caused by the restrictions. On the other hand, if we do the opposite, then we all could be severely affected because we may not have a, a good Christmas. I know the entertainment industry has been under stress because the, the restrictions, because of the restrictions, and it's a conversation that we're having, and it a lot depends, though, on what happens over the next few weeks. Thank you very much. I submitted one question, one final one. What informed the decision to quarantine Cornwall Courts, being that it is not in the top, 10, top 20 COVID hotspot communities in the, two weeks ago? Right. So we take the decision on the quarantining of communities based on a number of factors, not just the overall numbers, but other issues. As a matter of fact, maybe I shouldn't answer that question. Let me ask the epidemiologist, Dr. Webster Carr, to respond to that. I'm, I'm playing doctor, which probably I shouldn't, or playing an epidemiologist. Dr. Webster Carr, you want to just quickly answer that final question on 
what accounts for us determining quarantining of a community when it may not show that it has the most cases or more cases than others? was in the top 20 actually so they were in the top 20 they had that and the number of cases per population was highest in cornwall court um our dr johnson campbell can give us the community that cornwall court falls in but when we took that bigger community cornwall court had the highest number of cases i think absolute as well as per population so that's why Cornwall Court was was chosen for in that instance. So we look at a number of issues. We look at the rate of increase in cases, not just the absolute, and the number of probably deaths and poor outcomes that there have been um, for any community that may go under quarantine. Thank you. Thank you for his closing remarks. Okay, thank you very much. Not a lot to say given the time, and we have exceeded the hour and a half at, at this. A lot has been said, a lot to digest, and we want to thank those who have come on, those who have contributed, both in Kingston, the health team, and of course here in Montego Bay. Uh, thank you to the media for listening and following up with questions, and thanks to the S Hotel for hosting and phase three for providing technical support as usual and the PR unit at the ministry. This is a very important part of our um, strategy to managing COVID. We take it very seriously because we must continue the conversation to promote understanding and to convert uh, behavior, understanding into behavior that is. I wanna just quickly correct something. The 80,000 antigen tests are in fact here. I understand that the rest came in the island today or yesterday and are being cleared. So we now have the full numbers. It's now the training that we need to complete and the deployment of the test kits. And I believe in short order, uh, the challenges around testing will be much reduced, if not totally eliminated, with the private players, the additional antigen testing, and of course the gold standard PCR test. This has been another COVID conversation. Let us work together to overcome the possibility of the triple threat. It is very possible. It depends on us. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time.